Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi to my peers who are sitting around me. Um, I'm super excited to be here um, to moderate the last panel before the f closing remarks of the summit. And I think an, an important uh, panel, all-female panel. Um, and I know these women have something to say, so please listen to them this afternoon. Um, we're here to talk, as Tim said, about people and place. I'm going to start with a provocation um, that architecture is not just about buildings, and its essence it goes beyond that. Space and mass, um, the raw materials that you work with to create um, kind of architectural form. Um, but from them, as architects, you create a kind of more ordered, more poetic expression. Um, through that, architecture can be instrumental in creating our identities, in creating communities that are constructed along lines of shared interest, along religion, along kinship, um, and, other, and other factors on which we thrive. How that is achieved, so poetics of design, form, and also why it matters, is the subject of our conversation today. Although architecture can be a reflection of our identities, and that's something we should celebrate, I'm sure you're aware that it can also homogenize them. It can include, and it can also exclude. Who makes those choices? How, in what ways, have they played out? Um, and in your experience, um, architecture, which is conventionally bound up in structures of power, um, how um, you know, have you navigated those, and how have you worked within those systems to enable your own work and your voice? And it's most interesting, and I think the work that you're all doing, um, it, architecture can be a vessel for new voices and for ideas, um, and in, in the hands of, of the three of you, I hope we can unravel some of those, um, how that happens today. So, yeah, just to introduce the panel, um, here um, opposite me is Noura al Sayer, who's the head of architectural affairs for the Bahrain Authority for Culture and Anti Antiquities. Paloma Strelitz, who's the head of product development and creative director of Patch, a startup which is making the future of work more accessible and we'll hear more about, and also co-founder of Assemble, the architecture collective that won the Turner Prize. Um, and on my left, Samaya Valley, who some of you may have met this morning in a conversation with Tim, um, the youngest architect to design the Serpentine Pavilion, um, curator of the inaugural Islamic Arts Biennial, and many kind of projects to come. Um, so I'm going to start with you, um, Samaya. Could we please have Samaya's slides? up in the background. Thank you. In terms of the expression of identity through architecture, I think this is a really important work, one of the most seminal works of recent years. I wondered if you could tell us a bit about how the pavilion paid homage to existing identities within London, how you navigated those spaces and turned them into this sculptural installation. Yeah, so um, and Tim and I talked about it a little bit earlier, but it was very important for me to find ways to express London to London. And uh, when I first took on the project and started to think about it, I actually spent a lot of time at the Bishop's Gate Library and Archive. And I was particularly interested in events um, that were in spaces that are no longer, that no longer exist and also that had very little documentation. So for example, um, the Theatre for Black Women is one of those spaces, the Center Price Publishing House, which was a really important black and radical publishing house at the time. Um, I started to look at these spaces and work with them, um, and I worked with mapping them out and drawing them in form physically first. And for me, this was an act of making a contribution to the architectural archive. Regardless of what people felt in the pavilion, for the architectural community, I really wanted this to become a part of um, the canon, if I can say that. And I wanted to be able to place these works um, in architectural discourse, firmly in architectural discourse. I think so much of what you said in the introduction about um, uh, architecture being beyond building and you know being about rituals being about things that we do in space is also facilitated by space and for example some of these spaces um, 
just trying to pick up on one example, the mangrove restaurant in Notting Hill, because it, it held so many ingredients that were part of people's cultures, someone could come in and smell food from somewhere, you could hear sounds in dialects, accents, languages, and music from mother tongues. Um, because of the people that it attracted, there were you know, everyone from Nina Simone to um, community members, because of the interactions that it fostered, it really allowed for that place to become a hub for cultural production. It birthed the Notting Hill Carnival, of course. It also birthed the West Indian Gazette, um, some of the first calypsos also came out of that space. And uh, that, for me, presents us with different institutional logics for how we can think about how spaces can become cultural facilitators, how spaces reflect our identities back to us and are in conversation with us in how we not only honor the past of our identities and our heritages and ancestors, but also think about the future of where we want to evolve them, how we want to create in them, and um, you know, who we want to become in dialogue and in conversation with our spaces. And you know, and when you were growing up and, and you're training in the architect, to what degree did you see yourself and these identities reflected in the spaces around you? And how did that, you know, how, how, to what degree is your architecture, I suppose, a reaction to that or response to that? Well, I grew up in um, a very small apartheid uh, township in South Africa, Indian only. Uh, called Lodium, and I had a very strong community upbringing. The mosque was a center of community life. Um, and I often actually speak about my architecture being a lack of what we found in architectural school or in the canon, but I think it's also very important to acknowledge, and you're making me think about this now, that the forms of community I experienced, I also thought about it earlier uh, in conversation with Tim, being able to be surrounded by uh, the city of Johannesburg and the landscape that my grandfather's stores provided, all of these touchstones, I think, became important, and it wasn't conscious, but important um, lenses for me to see the world, and I hope that I honor them in my architecture, or at least in my ambitions for my architecture. I definitely also felt um, an incongruity between what I was taught in architecture school, and I had some incredible teachers in my architectural career and in architecture school, um, but for the most part, the curriculum that we're taught in schools is very, very, uh, it's very Western-centric and it's a very particular worldview of architecture. I never learned about India, I never learned about Mexico, let alone Africa or South Africa. And um, I often felt that what I experienced in the city of Johannesburg, this incredible place that I was studying in, uh, was, I was not reflected uh, in the curriculum at all. And a part of why um, I was interested with my friends at the time uh, in architecture school to start a studio was because I wanted to have a place to express this desire for Johannesburg and this excitement and energy, the rituals of the city, its rich lived experience and its cultural fabric into architecture, aesthetic and design form. Thank you. I did want to move on to talk about Dead Dub, but maybe we can come back mm -hmm. to that and move on to Bahrain since we're having a global conversation. Um, could we have Nuris slides, please? Thank you. Nura, um, I mean, you've been doing this incredible work in Bahrain over the past decade, um, reviving its cultural heritage through architecture. I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that work and some of the key projects that you've been working on. Yeah, thanks a lot. I think um, maybe let's start with one of the main projects that we're working on at the moment, which is the Purling Path. It's an urban rehabilitation project in the heart of the city of Muharraq, the second city in Bahrain. Um, it's a site that was inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List in 2012. And I think what's 
probably really particular about it, and especially in this part of the world, is that it's a culturally-led uh, urban regeneration project, reviving the memory of pearling that was so central to the island of, uh, of Muharraq, and introducing um, very contemporary architecture into the heart of the city. You know, I think maybe um, what has been really important for us um, in working with the old city was really understanding it as a living organism, you know, as a place where people have lived, where people had had memory in the past, but a living city, a contemporary city today that's home to a changed, you know, socio-demographic uh, population, and to understand, um, you know, how it's possible to, to work within this context in the Gulf today, what kind of architecture do you introduce um, to these kind of spaces. And really, I think, um, when I started working in Bahrain, this, this was 12 years ago, there was somehow the present condition didn't exist, you know? There were either very nostalgic depictions of the past, you know, in a very uh, romanticized way, or very kind of bold, futuristic renders of what the future uh, looked like. And the present as such as it is today did not exist. We didn't document it, we didn't look at it, we didn't... We couldn't even start to understand how to work with it because uh, it somehow didn't exist in the collective uh, imaginary of people. So a big part of the work that we started uh, doing in Muharraq was first to understand the city, to, to document it, to do a conservation plan, to understand who was living there, what the fabric looked like, and to understand how to intervene uh, in that fabric, and probably more, most importantly, how to understand that whatever we will introduce wouldn't be an impetus for the city to change um, dramatically beyond what made it um, very special. Um, I think another running line that's been really important in the work that we've been doing is to introduce public space. Um, but public space, you know, really in its most basic uh, understanding, open, free spaces that are not programmed, um, that are not actually overly designed, but just, I think, protecting the void. I think we're in a part of the world where urban development advances at such a speed that just voids in the city become something really important to protect for the future. Um, and I think that through this project, so we've, apart from all the rehabilitation work, we've also introduced a series of 17 public squares uh, ranging in sizes. Some are really small, some are larger, within the heart of the city. But also all the architectural interventions that we've had have a common thread that they protect or introduce a void or a large open space uh, within their architecture um, that aims to um, protect and promote ideas of publicness and openness in the city, places that can become shared spaces of encounter and shared spaces of encounter that are not gated, that are not commercial, um, that do not belong to anyone. You know, reintroducing within the city the idea of a public property. Amazing. I mean, for those who don't know about the project, could you tell us a bit about what those spaces were used for? Because Perling obviously has a long history in Bahrain. Um, was the purpose to use those spaces for their original function or introduce new functions? So the, at the core of the project, there are 17 properties um, that are spread throughout the old uh, historic city of Muharraq. And these properties were selected in relation to the, the narrative that they offer to the narrative of Perling. So what, what's specific probably and interesting about this project is that it's an a culturally-led um, urban regeneration that aims to revive the memory of Perling into the city. So these 16, 17 houses were selected because they're the house of a captain, they're the house of the pearl diver. They represent all um, the different social strata of the Perling economy that actually build the city of Muharraq. So one of the the outstanding universal value of this specific site is that it was a single product economy. So until the 1930s, everything that you see built in the island of Muharraq was built in direct relation to, um, to the economy of Perling. And this, unfortunately, after the demise of the Perling era up until today, um, disappeared not only in the built fabric in, of the city, but also in the intangible uh, heritage that we have of the city and the memory that people have of this very central activity um, in the island. So our work has really been on, on, on many levels. Obviously, 
Uh, the most obvious one is the physical restoration of um, the tangible heritage of Perling, but perhaps more importantly, reintroducing the intangible uh, aspects of the Perling heritage back into the city and making it a living part of the city um, with the composition of the city today, which is very different from what it was in the 1930s. Mm. And this obviously obliges us to, you know, to work and uh, face issue, you know, socio-demographic issues um, that are present in the city and Bahrain in general. You know, the fact that uh, the population has changed um, greatly. It's a lot more mixed than it was in the 1930s. There's a large part of the population in Muharraq that's transient. Um, and it obliges us to, to work with all these questions, to say, how do you you know, how do you design public space or public buildings in a city where probably more than half the population is transient, that has a very different relationship, a very mm. different sense of ownership, a very different way of inhabiting the city than if you were working with a city where, you know, most of the people have a more permanent relation to the city. So beyond the, you know, the physical challenge, the <coughs> architectural challenges of restoration, etc., how do you reinvigorate a sense of place, a sense of magic, a sense of relevance to contemporary um, inhabitants yeah, of the city I mean, that had been lost? It's, it's a challenging question, you know, and how do you, what is contemporary architecture in, in Muharraq today? You know, I think this was probably um, the main question that we had to answer. But I think that it was really important to, to address this question because at least, you know, 12 years ago when we started working on the project, there wasn't really an answer to that as to why. And I think, you know, beyond being a stylistic um, issue of architecture, it was really a, a problem of values. You know, what do we value today as a society? And what do we want to build that represents us? You know, what are the values uh, of, of the city? What does it want to promote? What kind of life between the inhabitants does it want to, to push forward? Um, and I think that we tried through the introduction of, um, you know, very contemporary architecture, but a contemporary architecture, I mean, you can see one of the images here, the last one, that is still um, very contextual, but that looks at all of the aspects of the city, you know, not only the decorative one, that looks at the way the city was built, that looks at the way the city is being used today um, by, its, uh, by its inhabitants, that looks at, um, you know, sustainability issues, all these questions were really important um, to answer, and I think it was important at a first stage to answer them through building, by presenting you know, examples within the heart of the city um, of what we could build a society today. And it was really important for us to introduce these projects into this historic context. You know, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the, the, the work and new architecture that's being introduced in this part of the world often happens in a more tabula rasa situation or, you know, on reclaimed land or where we kind of want to start new somewhere else. Yeah. And for us, it was really important to build on to what was built and to, to show that we needed to obviously preserve uh, the architectural heritage, but that we also you know, had a duty and a responsibility to a younger generation to produce new architecture that we think and believe hopefully in a 50, 60 years time will in turn uh, you know, be worthy of preservation. And yes. that these two could be present side by side in a living city. Yeah, that's a really important point that the idea of identity is shifts and I, uh, architecture is a long game. It can take decades yes. to realize a project. So how does architecture keep pace with the shifting tides of identity, but also remain relevant? And that must be a huge challenge in your, in your work. Um, OK, perhaps we could talk about Paloma's work and then come together and explore some of those ideas. Could we have Paloma's slides? Thank you. <coughs> Wonderful, the Cinerolium, that's a good starting point, I think. Paloma, maybe we could talk about some of, I mean, Assemble, there's, there's a lot there in terms of um, placemaking, but um, I think what we, we're going to focus on is perhaps uh, reuse of existing buildings and Cinerolium, uh, a disused petrol station that was converted into a cinema, really amazing, really playful and inventive reuse of space. Can you tell us a little bit about it, how you went about it? How did you decide to <laughs> embark on this really ambitious uh, uh, project? Thanks, Priya. Yeah, so the Cinerolium was Assemble's very first project. And at that point, we were, um, this was 10 years ago, we were very recent graduates from architecture school. And we really just wanted an opportunity to put 
all these ideas that we were learning about at school into action, just to do it ourselves and to try to, to shape a project you know, with our own imagination. So at the time, there was a, we read a newspaper article about the fact that there were these, all these disused petrol stations in London, these structures which are part of everybody's everyday life that we often, you know, uh, are sort of critical to how we live in the city, but sort of go by unnoticed. And we were really excited about this opportunity of for how could you reimagine this bit of everyday infrastructure so that it became something theatrical and imaginative and exciting. So uh, a group of us who had studied together got together to, uh, to build what we called the Cineroleum. So that was transforming this disused petrol station into a temporary cinema, which we then ran for a month of screenings. And um, basically, we used the structure of the petrol station canopy. And we, uh, together, we, did, we sort of built it ourselves. That was part of the principle, that it would be a sort of site of craft and experimentation. So we hand-sewed, or through sewing machines, um, the, this curtain which hung around the petrol station canopy, which created this sort of permeable indoor-outdoor space. And under the petrol station canopy, we built a, a rake of seating. And fr from within that, we did these screenings. So we showed everything from sort of road movies to Barbarella, basically anything about journeys and adventure, and really kind of the bring. It was all about bringing the joy of the cinema back into the heart of the city, which is in a way where cinema first came from. So um, during the screenings, the audience would be in this sort of interior space enclosed by this sort of epic silver curtain. Um, but then at the end of each screening, we would raise the curtain so the audience were suddenly um, visible to the street and to passers-by. And it was this really joyful moment when um, uh, you know, the spectators suddenly became the spectacle and all these passers-by started looking in and trying to understand the experience. And the Cinerolium was about lots of things for us, but I think, you know, in essence, there were these... Um, it, was, you know, it was a desire for this sort of sense of agency in the world around us, in, in the city, which had been sort of the source of you know, what we'd studied as architects. Um, a desire to do it ourselves, so to just literally learn, learn the tools and the crafts of building. And then also in this sort of sense of like reuse and, ima uh, 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 you know, reuse and, imag and reimagination of the structures that we see every day. Um, and, then, and then lastly, actually, just about, about community, about, about bringing people together for, um, for a new experience um, and for a new way of experiencing the city. Thank you. Um, I think one feature that your work has in common is you're, you're creating architecture not for a developer, not necessarily for the client or for government, but for the people who use it. And I wondered how do you go about ensuring that that's possible? How do you involve communities in your practice and you know how do you engage with the user the ultimate user of the spaces you're creating i mean i think in in the you know in the case of our project in harraq it's it was inevitable not to work with the community because the project was for them and i think one of the the really important um decisions that were taken early on in the project was to try uh, and expropriate as little as possible. And I think this is unfortunately sometimes, uh, you know, one of the big mistakes that's done in this part of the world with urban regeneration projects. Um, so most of the work and properties that we work on are actually still owned by the, the families. Um, and so it means that the project that you do is a conversation uh, with them and an ongoing conversation, um, you know. That's often, uh, you know, it takes a lot longer. It's it's messy. It's not direct. It's, but it ensures that you, you know, that first of all the community is of course involved in what you do, but that you don't lose a very important um, memory and, and relation that people have to the city. That once this bond is is broken, you know, it's it, it's nearly impossible to reestablish or to uh, to replace. Um, you know, but it, it also means on the downside that we're extremely involved with the community, probably a bit too much, you know, like, uh, I mean, I, I know how many car parks uh, the neighbors need if someone gets married or, but, you know, I think at this, at this stage of the project, um, it was really important um, to have this relationship with the community. But it's, it's also important to understand that it's a conversation. You know, I think that there has been a lot of emphasis um, on not having a top-down approach and having a more community-based um, one. Um, 
you know, which is of course true in many cases, but we've also um, learned through the work that we've been doing over the 12 years um, that it's really a back and forth. You know, we've had instances, for example, when we introduced the public spaces and we wanted to start working on them where we did, we met with the community uh, to understand what they wanted to see in these places, spaces that were just barren spaces um, that they, had, they were mostly parking their cars in them. So we started a conversation and a survey and we went from house to house and, you know, we had reached just the fourth house of one square, I think. Um, and we had counted that what everyone wanted was for sure parking space, and by the fourth house, we had counted, I think, 76 cars that they needed. It was like 50 square meters. So we, we you know, immediately understood that this was somehow leading to a dead end, and that we maybe needed to take a step back um, and also trust in the vision, the overall vision that we had in the city as planners um, and as urban rehabilitation specialists and architects, um, to kind of believe in the bigger vision that there was for the city. And we then introduced two of these public spaces as mock-ups, and they were there uh, in the city for two years, actually, before we went further. And after the two years, we went back to the community and then asked them again, you know, there's these squares, what do you think, what you... And, and it was funny because at that point, they were able to give us extremely precise feedback on the design of these squares. That was extremely helpful for us. But in the meantime, they had completely forgotten that these were barren lands oh, wow. two years ago. You know, they started telling us, yeah, you know, but the trees weren't like that before. And so sometimes you also need, you know, as, a, as an architect to to uh, believe in the power of the imagination that you have in the bigger picture, and yeah. it needs to be a back and forth between these, uh, yeah. you know, these two elements. Yeah, I think your engagement with communities and with kind of grassroots ideas is the way that it shapes your work is extremely important to the future of architecture. And I guess one of the challenges in enabling those ideas to have a platform, to have a voice, is the structures in which architecture operates. Um, you know, it requires a huge amount of capital. Some of us have discussed this um, at other times. Um, and you know, the culture of the kind of star architect as being omniscient and so on has sort of prevailed. How have you kind of, as women, you know, trying to express new ideas, how have you found a platform for those ideas and what kinds of challenges have you faced? Um, well, I think platforms like this, uh, platforms for idea the sharing of ideas, platforms like pavilions and biennales are incredibly important in how they set the tone for the future and how they allow us to project our imaginations um, into those spaces. I completely agree with what Nora is saying about the agency and the power of or taking on the responsibility again of being an architect and of someone who is responsible for charting the future, which sounds quite scary, but as I said earlier, I think too many of us shy away from that, and so many of us are not given the opportunity of having that voice um, because of perhaps who we are or where we come from or the amount of capital that's required, the systems and the structures that we're bound to. Um, I don't know, I don't think there's an easy answer for how that's navigated. The one thing to do, uh, well, I, maybe speaking from experience, the thing that I started to do when I started my practice is to practice at many, many different paces. So to work at the slow pace of having um, a pedagogical and a studio practice to pour ideas into, to work on deep archival work, to think about listening to other sources. Uh, at the same time, also to work with artistic practice, um, which is perhaps or sometimes can be much more fast-paced and much more immediate than architectural works. And I still believe very much in that as a form of practice, as a, f as a way to test ideas that will then become the future of how we build um, collaborations are incredible ways also to, to test ideas. I just want to honor Noura, who's one of our participating artists for the first Islamic Arts Biennale. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, um, Samaya. And if I can just very quickly say her work is extremely pertinent uh, because of the archive that she's working with. On the one hand, she's working with this 
incredible oral installation that will be uh, focusing on the Friday sermons from Al-Aqsa, Mecca, and Medina, from the three holy sites. And we will have this oral experience of being immersed in these Friday sermons and their messages of unity across time, I think from the 50s. But what we found through working on the project is that it's also a deep dive into an archive that is very difficult to source. And so the importance of having platforms for this kind of work to chart forward our future, but also to remember and reckon with how our past can evolve into our future, is incredibly important. I think the, yeah, the future is an interesting concluding question because I think we're running out of time, unfortunately. But um, you know, I think the culture of architecture and the ambitions of the architects maybe are shifting and that's sort of reflected in your work. And I wondered whether is it your ambition to kind of build and multiply all over the world in the way that maybe the aspirations of a previous generation might have been shaped or in all, you know, these ideas of identity and so on, are they more kind of crucial and is it more about that than, than about scale and, and, so, and so on? I don't know if that resonates at all. I might, I might pick up on that. And I think what's not, you know, the, what our work is, is really important and it's, you know, a delight to be on stage with both of you. But I think even more importantly, we want many more people to be having a stake in how our cities and our built environments are made. And it's just so important, this point about civic agency and people feeling like they have um, a say in their, in their future, in their communities' uh, futures, because that means that we will be able to create a world which is more reflective of everybody's needs, dreams, and ideas. And I think that's at the heart of this sort of conversation about top-down development or grassroots um, architecture. It's, you know, we, we ultimately need an ecosystem. I think that's, that there's a, there's a path forward where we will have both. But what I would love to see going forwards is to see many, many more people involved both in the conversation and in that action about how our cities are made. Thank you so much. Um, I think that's a really, really important point. And just to conclude, because I know we've got our closing remarks now, um, yeah, really wonderful to talk to you guys. And I know I started by saying architecture was not just about buildings, but I just, given everything that you've just shown us and the incredible work you're doing, I just want to say these women are, they, they can build the cities of your future. So <laughs> here they are, listen to them, commission them. And oh, yeah, I think they deserve a round of applause. So thank you. Thank you.